good morning, everyone. Um, so as Elise explained, I will talk about our work on membrane based solutions. Um, so I will uh, start with um, introducing biocatalysis. Um, then I will give you some examples of membrane based solutions. Um, first is in situ corporate product removal um, with in, uh, emollient ester synthesis. Um, then I'll talk about in situ solvent recycling in macrocyclization and sugar ester synthesis. And in the end, I will talk about in situ product recovery in chiral amine synthesis. Um, so biocatalysis is a broader term uh, which is used to um, explain a reaction which is catalyzed by a biological agent. This could be a growing cell in a fermentation where the substrate is used to grow and maintain the cell as well as to produce the product. Um, on the other hand is the dead cells where the enzyme is uh, removed from the cells. Um, the fermentation can be a de novo fermentation where uh, the uh, substrate or the carbohydrates are used to produce primary and set secondary metabolites by the product or a precursor fermentation where an external agent is um, uh, converted. For example, the uh, uh, redox reactions uh, or hydroxylation of steroids and such. Uh, examples. Uh, when we talk of the dead cells um, or inactive cells, then uh, we can also use the whole cells as such without extracting the enzymes from them, or we can use really the cell free enzymes where the cells are also removed and we really have an isolated enzyme uh, which has to be replaced after its inactivation. Um, and the examples which I present here are with the cell free enzymes. Um, enzymes are a uh, safe and sustainable catalyst. They are non-toxic, non-hazardous. Uh, they work at milder temperatures and very, very selective. They have very high chemo, regio and stereo selectivities. So we have low or no side reactions and uh, they are produced from renewable resources, as I just said, by fermentation. And then um, the cost of producing them is quite predictable and stable. Um, there are some concerns with the use of enzymes which are associated to some cost, availability, stability, um, then their dependence on cofactors, especially for the oxidoreductase group of the enzymes and development time. Um, cost, development time, availability are more associated with the new enzymes. Looking at the biocatalysis landscape and its potential today, um, so enzymes, they were used traditionally in uh, food, beverage processing, detergents, and uh, later after 1970 or so, it was became it became evident that, uh, OK, these isolated enzymes can also be used to catalyze non natural compounds. And then in the last 40 years, biocatalysis really emerged from a fringe technology to a very established technology which has uh, relevant industrial potential. Um, especially the last two decades, um, biocatalysis has benefited from two very important technology of uh, 21st century, which is uh, biotechnology and information technology. Uh, biotechnology helped us to uh, change what was naturally occurring and information technology enabled uh, the use of searchable databases and predictive computer assisted modeling. Um, due to these advances in the coming years, we are now not limited to uh, nature's biochemistry, but we will see more and more non-naturally occurring uh, reactions as well. Um, so the biocatalysis landscape is highly <clears throat> rich and it has a lot of potential. Uh, but industrial implementation of enzymes, especially for bulk chemistry, still stays a bone of contention. Um, so there has been a lot demonstrated for the industrial organic synthesis, but the scope needs to be expanded. Um, what do we need? We need uh, engineering uh, of the superior enzymes and expanding the toolbox. And sometimes these enzymes are already existing. We have good enzymes for the some of the processes already. And uh, then the recovery and reuse at that moment is important. And here enzyme immobilization has um, uh, made a big uh, revolution because um, when the enzymes are immobilized, they are really seen as recoverable, reusable, heterogeneous catalyst, which improves their performance in organic chemistry. 
and the last but the most important is also the efficient process so going from a discovery of the enzyme engineering the protein demonstrating the reaction in a laboratory scale condition we also need efficient processes to bring enzymatic process closer to the industry and here the protein engineer and the process engineer has to work together in tandem to um, face this challenge um, I will here now start with the example with the membrane based process uh, for in situ product removal in an emollient ester synthesis. Um, so esters are compounds which we used in our daily life in the food, cosmetics, lubricants, fragrance, flavors, <clears throat> biofuels, a lot of them contain esters. Um, and traditionally, um, in a conventional process, the esters are produced by the reaction between an acid and alcohol. Um, and these reactions are done um, with metal or acid catalyst at around 200 degrees. Uh, due to this, the uh, thermo-induced side reactions are produced, uh, are formed, and we have a malodorous or dark product, uh, which requires further process processing, um, like bleaching with hydrogen peroxide, deodorization, and then eventually all that waste has to be removed, um, and we have to uh, final uh, finalize the uh, DSP steps. When we look at the enzymatic production. Um, for some of the um, esters, we can even do solvent free reaction, which means we just take the two substrates, the acid and the alcohol, and do the reaction at a temperature around like 60 or 70 degrees. And we have a very pure product which requires minimal downstream processing. Um, and esterification is an equilibrium reaction. So, um, we have acid and alcohol and we have water as a byproduct. It could be methanol or um, other alcohol, depending upon which uh, starting material we use. Uh, now, to, to really bring the reaction to completion, we need the continuous removal of byproduct, in this case, water. Um, and there are various methods for water removal, like reactive distillation, molecular sieve absorption, blowing inert gas, or pervaporation. But the choice, really depends on the physicochemical properties of substrates and products. Uh, for example, if we are blowing an uh, inert gas um, through a reaction which contains uh, close boiling substrates or azeotropes, um, our reaction or our uh, method of water removal wouldn't be so effective. And there, uh, pervaporation as a technology can uh, play important role. So what is pervaporation? It is a membrane process which is used for the separation of binary or multi-component liquid mixtures. And it is a combination of permeation and evaporation. So we have our feed, uh, which is in the reactive, in contact with the reactive side of our membrane. Um, and the membrane is a dense and non-porous uh, uh, medium, uh, which leads to the separation. So the feed components in the feed have affinity towards the membrane. This membrane could be a hydrophilic membrane or a hydrophobic membrane. And the uh, permeating components pass through the membrane uh, where other side that we have uh, some vacuum which helps in desorption or the collection of the permeate on the other side. Um, so um, here is the integrated reaction and pervaporation in uh, laboratory. So we have a packed bed column which contains enzyme. And in this side, we have a reactor loop. This is a tank which contains our feed where our product is continuously forming. And on the right side is the membrane, pervaporation membrane, which continuously removes water. Uh, this is the reactor in the uh, laboratory. So here is the packed bed column which is connected to a a reaction vessel and on the right side these are tubular membranes which we use for water removal continuously from the uh, reaction setup uh, from the reaction mixture um, so looking at the results uh, we have um, high conversion of uh, the fatty acid substrate so what did we do we have acid and alcohol in two on one ratio this is for isopropyl palmitate synthesis i don't know if you still see um, yeah how can i remove this um but isopropyl uh, palmitate synthesis is palmitic acid and isopropanol so we use two molar of isopropanol with one mole of uh, palmitic acid uh, eventually we have uh, less than 28 percent residual alcohol in the product one to two percent acid and 
the uh, maximum amount is the product that we want. Um, here on the right side, uh, you see the water removal. Uh, we let the water accumulate in the reaction and then start the pervaporation to remove the water continuously. Um, and this uh, reaction has a very stable performance. We did not have any loss of reaction uh, substrates or products during water removal. Um, so water is very selectively removed and the enzyme and membranes uh, performance was uh, very stable. Uh, this reaction is also um, demonstrated for couple uh, glycerol esters in this uh, integrated setup. I cannot. Uh, okay. Uh, next to um, the in experimentation, there is also um, modeling which helps to uh, predict what we can expect in future. So based upon our experimental results of enzyme kinetics and pervaporation performance, we develop a tool uh, called Pervap. And this tool um, takes uh, the effect of enzyme loading membrane surface uh, on the prediction of the reaction, like how fast uh, can we um, do the reaction or what kind of enzyme loading and membrane surface is required to uh, get that amount of product. And this um, can also give input for the techno-economic assessment and gain the insights on what is dem dominating the cost. Um, so here is an example of this uh, isopropyl palmitate synthesis uh, in the PERVAP tool. So what you see on the right side is um, decline in the reaction component in function of time. So um, these, uh, these um, blocks are the experimental data for per palmitic acid and isopropanol decline, and this is the production of the product and a decline of water. And uh, you see that we simulate it with two um, enzyme loadings. So the yellow line is one gram per kilogram enzyme loading, which is much closer to the experimental data. And then the blue line is um, the 15 gram per kilogram enzyme loading, which we actually had used, but um, the modeling told us that there might be some diffusional limitations which we can avoid and can get better performance from the same amount of enzymes. Um, and here uh, on the left, you see that uh, when we ran our reaction at 10 times higher speed, we get a much faster conversion. So these are the things that help us to predict um, the, the time, the component of the reaction and eventual performance that we can expect. Um, also, um, looking at the techno-economic assessment, because which is then again very important to really predict um, how close is this process to what we are thinking. So we used our data to do a techno-economic assessment and we find that about 20% uh, cost is the cost of biocatalyst and the rest are the uh, labor, electricity, our feedstocks and uh, uh, other uh, requirements, I mean, repair and maintenance of the um, plant. Um, so that was about um, in situ co-product removal for emollient ester synthesis. Uh, next example I give about in situ solvent recycling. Um, and here, uh, why do we know why do we need this because uh, sometimes the, there are reactions which need low dilution conditions for example cyclization reaction so uh, we want to cyclize this compound so we need to work at a very high diluted component uh, concentration but if we increase the concentration then we make oligomers and polymers of this monomer and we do not really achieve uh, what we want so we have to work at high solvent load conditions and their uh, membrane process can help by integrating the solvent recovery, uh, which can really improve the yield and pur purity and also reduce the mass process mass intensity, which means the, the amount of waste that we are generating uh, uh, related to the amount of product we are formed that can go down. Um, so one of the example that I can now show is uh, for this peptide uh, cycling. So here are uh, some sulfide groups in this uh, nanopeptides which um, cyclize uh, to form uh, these uh, uh, cyclic peptide. And here uh, the solvent recycling was integrated. Um, we have here uh, the um, feed which is uh, controlledly uh, added to this dilution, uh, uh, this reaction uh, mixture where there are highly diluted conditions. And this is connected to a filtration unit which continuously recycle the solvent and 
can improve the solvent usage in the process. And uh, here we have a decline of about 85% solvent use for the production of these uh, polypeptide and uh, the yield and uh, the conversion are also improved. So without compromising the process, there is a solvent uh, reuse which has been demonstrated for this particular process. Um, uh, and what I showed is um, a chemical process which is perfectly applicable to the biocatalytic process as well. Um, if you, we come to a biocatalytic process for sugar ester synthesis, uh, what happens here is that we have this reactor which contains uh, sugar, for example, glucose and lauric acid, and we want to make uh, such compounds, for example, a lauric acid uh, attached, one lauric acid molecule attached to sugar, so which is glucose monolaurate, or two uh, compounds attached, uh, two lauric acid attached to sugar, so glucose dilaurate. And in this case, um, because uh, sugar is highly insoluble and um, lauric acid, so there are very two different polarity compounds. And uh, we used 2-methyltubutanol as a solvent because it's not possible to work in the solvent-free mode uh, with these uh, different solubilities. So um, we also looked at is there a possibility of solvent recycling in this process? The process works uh, very well. We have, in function of time, good conversion of our lauric acid molecules, and these are the two compounds we produce. If we go from substrate concentration from 100 to 800, we increase the amount of diester, which is also um, ex expected. Um, and then we take this mix to do organic solvent nanofiltration, and we found that yes, uh, with one of the commercially available membrane, it is possible to retain um, major components inside the reactor and then reuse the solvent for the next uh, batch or the next cycle. It can also be combined in a continuous process as uh, shown uh, before. Um, so after uh, this, I go to the last example, uh, which is the membrane-based solution for in-situ uh, product recovery in chiral amines. Uh, so a chiral uh, molecule um, is yeah, very important in nature. Uh, like a lot of proteins, carbohydrate, hormones are um, chiral. It's like our hands, uh, which are non-superimposable mirror images of each other. And uh, so chirality is the base of life on Earth. And it is very important in um, the uh, pharmaceutical industry because most often uh, the desired activity of a drug is associated to one enantiomer. Uh, a very known example is thalidomide uh, drug, which was prescribed in 1950s uh, to pregnant women uh, for morning sickness and later on it was found that it was linked to some uh, limb malfunctions and defects with the babies and uh, only after 70 or 79 it was established that actually our enantiomer is the effective enantiomer and the S uh, thalidomide was a tetra, uh, tetra, teratogen. Um, so this disaster could have been avoided if we this drug was not a racemic mixture. So this how um, important uh, chirality is. Uh, today, it's uh, highly um, used, uh, valuable building block uh, chiral amines, and they are uh, used for the synthesis of active pharmaceutical uh, ingredients. And uh, um, currently, a drug like citagliptin, which is used for diabetes treatment or rivastigmine for mild uh, uh, Alzheimer, contain chiral amine moiety and this is uh, more and more drugs are being uh, uh, discovered which contain this uh, chiral amines in their um, structure. Chemically, uh, chiral amines are synthesized uh, uh, traditionally in this way but by the chemical uh, methods and one is that there is a racemic mixture of two enantiomers and uh, it is resol resolved by precipitation of one of the enantiomer. Uh, which uh, gives eventually 50% yield, or there is asymmetric hydrogenation or the asymmetric reduction of the prochiral precursors by several steps. And um, this requires protection and deprotection. Um, and also um, the enantiomer selectivity that we get in the end is not perfect, so further purification is required. Um, 
it is possible to synthesize chiral amines enzymatically, and there are various enzymes, so lipase, monoamine oxidases, amine reductases, and so on. Um, and all of them has their advantages and disadvantages in terms of substrate scope, um, solvent stability, uh, inhibition, uh, dependence on the cofactors, uh, like that. Uh, what we talk about today here is uh, amine transaminases, um, also known as uh, yeah, omega transaminases. So here we um, can do the reaction in two ways. One is also the cattle resolution. So that means we have the racemic mixture and we do the resolution to get the amine of our interest. Or we start with uh, the prochiral substrates such as ketones and uh, uh, use a sacrificial amine donor, which provides these amine group to the ketone and produces the chiral amine. Um, so what are the advantages that these ketones, they are readily available uh, building blocks or can be synthesized? Uh, the regio and stereoselectivity of biocatalysts are often quite good. And um, now a lot of engineered omega transaminases are available, which have broad substrate scope and stability. Um, there are some issues associated still with the reaction is um, there is unfavorable thermodynamic equilibrium, which means that uh, this amino donor needs to be provided in excess to really complete the reaction. Um, and uh, there are inhibition with, uh, with the product and uh, co-product that can uh, inhibit the enzyme. And uh, so to achieve the high yield in situ product or co-product removal is often required. So. If there is a very efficient biocatalyst, uh, it's very good. But in case these issues occur, we need to um, uh, uh, investigate the process to really uh, get good yields. So this is like there is downstream processing, there is catalyst, and here is the process, which is the, the operating space we have to find uh, in case um, there are limitations with the biocatalysts. Um, so here uh, is the... Um, example of in situ product recovery. So what we did is, uh, as I explained, that we have a keto substrate and an amine donor to produce chiral amine. Uh, and this is often um, a short uh, amine donor isopropylamine that we uh, is used. Um, if we want to remove this uh, chiral amine uh, very uh, selectively, then we also lose the amine donor, which is provided already in excess. So we uh, change this amine donor uh, with some long chain jeffomines, which has much higher molecular weight compared to isopropylamine, and uh, use this reaction for uh, process intensification in an enzyme membrane reactor and enzyme membrane contactor. Um, so in enzyme membrane reactor, uh, we used a nanofiltration membrane. So this is the reaction tank uh, under pressure, and this is the nanofiltration membrane. Um, this is a process which is under pressure, and uh, there is a certain pore size of the membrane, and the components which are larger than the pore size are retained, and the smaller are uh, permeated so it's working on the sieving effect and uh, using such a reaction so the first important thing is are the commercially uh, occurring enzyme uh, can they use uh, jeffamine as uh, amine donor uh, that was the first establishment so that uh, there we found a commercial enzyme and then combining this process with an enzyme membrane reactor we saw that okay we can retain more than 85 percent of the amine donor by nanofiltration and uh, we can enhance the process by additional 25 percent conversion of the substrate compared to the base case um, the the next uh, method of in situ product recovery um, is the enzyme membrane reactor so here uh, is the, the same um, uh, way that we use high molecular weight amine donor, but then enzyme membrane reactor works um, on a function of um, phase equilibrium that we have the reaction components um, and there is a membrane which is separating the two phases, but this is not giving any sieving effect. We have a counter current flow of two. Uh, so the reaction component also is here. The reaction was done in organic solvent and heptane. Uh, the one advantage to do reaction in an organic solvent compared to uh, aqueous is that we can have higher solubility of our substrates, uh, such as these kinds of molecules as benzyl acetone. 
um, and we can very selectively extract our amine in the aqueous phase. Um, and in this case, it was an acidic aqueous phase so that the amine which is uh, extracted in this aqueous phase is trapped and we can avoid the back extraction. Um, here uh, you see the schematic here, uh, our amine donor and enzymes were um, uh, at the bottom of the reaction and and heptane is the liquid phase which brings uh, to which our product transports and uh, by the uh, contactor mechanism we could extract the um, buff, uh, the product amine into the aqueous buffer uh, this improved the process four times uh, compared to the reaction uh, without any extraction. And it also gave 95% um, product, pure product in the aqueous phase. Um, with that, I can uh, conclude that membrane assisted technology can intensify the enzymatic processes. As I showed you, uh, per evaporation uh, is highly effective for in situ removal of uh, water in the reactions which involve volatile substrates or products or azeotrope formation. Uh, Model-based approaches can help in prediction of uh, the reaction conditions uh, or process designing for uh, similar kind of reactions in future. Um, then nanofiltration as a technology for solvent recycling, where we really need to work in dilute conditions due to the solubility or other reaction related issues. Then membrane extraction and contactor, where the selective extraction of the product um, is possible in a complicated matrix. Um, but also these applications depend on the reactions, substrate, products, solubilities. So we have to devise each time a tailored solution to provide intensification uh, in a enzymatic reaction. And with that, I would like to thank all my colleagues at Vito, uh, Vini, Liva, Martha, Helmut, Walter, and Dominique, whom I work closely with, and also Claudia, uh, who did her PhD at Vito, and she did the work on the chiral amines. Um, so with that, I would like to uh, thank all of you for joining. And if there are questions, uh, yeah, I would be very happy to answer them.